Um, okay, why don't we get this started? Uh, I am Jason Lowpower. For those of you who are on any of the Gym 5 mailing lists, I'm sure, sure you've seen my emails over and over and over again. This is my face to put with the name. Um, before we get started, a little bit about you guys. How many people are grad students? Most. How many people have any experience with Gym 5? What kind of experience do you have? What kind of experience do you have with Gym 5? A couple of months. Just playing around with it? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Just running simple things. Running simple things? Yeah? Trying to modify the memory model? Trying to modify the memory model? For Ruby, oh, yeah. that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be covering, covering much Ruby today, or any. That would be another day-long tutorial all by itself. Um, maybe someday. But, um, cool, so those who are not grad students, are you working in industry, or here for fun? Yeah, working? Undergrad. Undergrad, cool, okay. Well, <clears throat> seems like there's a wide variety of people. Hopefully this is going to be uh, something that a lot of you can get out of it. Um, we also have a couple senior Gen 5 developers here. Uh, Andreas up here, who's at ARM. And Steve Reinhardt in the back, who some might say started this whole thing a while ago. When did Gen 5 start, Steve? Uh, it's been uh, probably 13, 14 years ago. Yeah, so a while. Um, so yeah, first, what is Gym 5? Um, Gym 5 is a combination of the Michigan M5 simulator and the Wisconsin Gems simulator. Both of which were started around the same time in the early 2000s. Um, and when you're using Gym 5, this is the paper that we ask you to cite. Doesn't really matter. With a million authors. Um, and Gym 5 has been around as Gym 5 for about a little over five years now. Um, and I've been involved in Gym 5 pretty much all those five years. I came on right as uh, things started kicking off. Um, okay, so this tutorial, uh, it's going to be interactive. Um, we're going to do a lot of uh, coding examples. So I'm going to be coding along with you guys. Um, work along with me for the best results here. Um, and please ask questions. It's going to be much better for you guys if we're communicating back and forth than me just lecturing to you um, all morning. So quickly to go over the schedule, um, the morning we're going to do this learning Gym 5 thing, and then in the afternoon we're going to do a coding sprint, and I hope you guys stay around for that. We have a bunch of little bite-sized projects that um, even people who are relatively new to the code base should be able to help out with, and we'll have um, more senior developers come in in the afternoon that'll be around to help um, guide and help you get hopefully some code actually put up to review board or our Garrett um, post today. So that, that should be fun. So before the break, we're going to try to cover building Gym 5, config scripts, Gym 5 output, and a simple memory object. And we're really going to try to get through just as much as we can before the break. Um, so we might get a little bit further, or maybe not. Um, after the break, we're going to come back and talk about how to use the event-driven simulation infrastructure in Gym 5. Um, parameters to some objects, talk some about the memory system. Um, this will be Gem 5's memory system, not Ruby. And then briefly, I have a bunch of slides which just kind of a laundry list of Gem 5's features. So. And there should be some time at the end to talk about things that I didn't talk about if you guys have other questions. Um, then right after lunch, Andreas is going to give a quick talk about how to contribute to Gem 5. We are in a transition phase, moving away from our current commit infrastructure to a totally new one, which should be much, much improved. Um, and then after the break in the afternoon, we'll just continue our sprints. Okay, so um, let's get started building Gym 5. So um, I've already done this, so I'm not going to do it right now. But uh, if you haven't done so, if you don't have Gym 5 sitting on your laptop right now, you can clone this repo. We are moving from our Mercurial host on some server in Michigan 
to Google's cloud infrastructure soon. Um, so you can download it from there now. And then check out the HPCA branch <coughs> in case we're making changes this afternoon. And it has a couple bug fixes from upstream too. And you can build with this uh, scons command, which we'll talk about more in a second. Hopefully we don't destroy the uh, Wi-Fi by everyone trying to download this at once. <laughs> the reason why we're not downloading from the Michigan server is because we pretty much took down the Michigan server when I tried this one other time. I'll give you a second to get that down. Anyone need more time with this? OK, cool. So um, for this build command, um, so first is SCONS. SCONS is the build system that we're using for Chunk 5. It's kind of like a make file, but a million times more complicated. Um, it's really flexible, which we use a lot of that flexibility in Chunk 5's build system. And in fact, all the SCONS script files are just regular Python files that are interpreted with a Python interpreter. So you can do a lot of stuff. Um, this next part is the parameter that you're passing to the SCONS script file. And this parameter says, I want to build in the build directory. I want to use x86 as my default, and I want to build the binary to a file. Um, so this x86 is, if you look in the build ops folder, there are a number of different default build options. And so you can do build whatever that default build option is and build that option. We're doing x86 because I assume all of you have x86 computers in front of you. Um, and then finally, the binary we're building is gem5.opt, and this is the optimized version of the binary. It's somewhere between, it's faster than debug, not quite as fast as fast, but it has debug symbols built in, so you can use GDB and debug flags, which we'll be talking about later. And then of course, minus j5, because everyone has at least four cores in their machine, right? Okay. So while that's compiling on your computers or not, um, I want to talk some about the overarching architecture of Gem5. Um, and what we're going to be spending most of today talking about are sim objects. This is um, Gem5's main abstraction to uh, almost everything in Gem5 is a sim object. So pretty much all the C++ objects somehow inherit from sim object. Um, and what this represents is some physical component in the system that you're simulating. Um, by the way, I will have all these slides online. And I'm also recording this. So it should be posted to YouTube sometime when I can upload it. Um, yeah, so everything is a sim object. So one thing sim objects can do is in queue events. So Gem5 is a discrete event simulator. And the way it works is you have a bunch of events that are all tagged with some time that that event needs to fire at. So then we look at the head of the event queue, which is on the bottom in this picture for some reason. And whatever time the head of the event queue is, that's the current time of the system. So then you pop off the event at the head of the event queue. You execute this event. This event maybe generates other events for other times, goes back into the event queue in time order. So you could insert events here or even um, at the head. And then time moves on. So the next time step, we go to 11. And after this event is executed, we go to time 20. So to do anything in Gen 5, you have to enqueue these events um, and use this event-driven process. And all sim objects can enqueue events into the event queue. And we'll cover more about this um, after the break this morning. OK, so let's talk about configuration scripts. So uh, how many of you are currently compiling Gem 5? A few. And it's still going, I assume? All right. Well, jump over to another window, and we'll talk about configuration scripts. Um, so the interface to Gem5, and this is something I really want to stress, 
the user interface for Gen 5 is not the command line. The user interface for Gen 5 is Python scripts. The way you interface is you write a Python script that configures the simulator, runs the simulator, executes the simulator, and you can do all sorts of things here. Um, but that's how you control Gen 5. It's not by running it in the command line. These scripts define the system that you want to model. So you can create your entire system in Python. Um, and they also control the simulation. And what's really cool about Gen 5 and what makes this really powerful is that all the C++ objects in the source folder are exposed via Python. So um, you get to use any of those objects you've created in the Python scripts. So let's make one. Let's make a simple script. So the first system we're going to simulate is something super simple. We have a CPU, a memory bus, and a memory controller. So let's hook the, um, let's do this. Okay. So let's create a new file, a new directory, configs, HPCA. Tutorial. Can you guys read this okay? In the back? All right, cool. So um, everything in this configs directory, this is where your configuration scripts go. Um, and there are many examples in there already. So if we edit configs, HPCA tutorial, simple.py. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is import the M5 library, which maybe we should rename this Gem5. Uh, we haven't for the past five years, so maybe it'll never happen. Um, so import that, and then uh, from m5.objects, import star. So this imports all of the sim objects that we've compiled into our the namespace in this Python. So the first thing we'll create is we're going to instantiate a system. This is going to be the system that we're simulating. Now we have to set a few defaults for this system. The first one being the clock domain. Then I set a clock domain on the system. Then we need to set this clock domain. Clock domain dot clock and say one gigahertz. So we're gonna run the clock in. You also have to set a voltage domain. We could just use whatever the defaults are there. So after we set up the clock, the next thing is we're going to set the system's memory mode to timing. And there are a few different memory modes in Gym 5. Timing, atomic, um, and then a couple, one or I think one other that's a specialized mode. You want to almost always use timing mode. And this is pretty important. If you use atomic memory mode, that's really just for fast forwarding and warming up caches. It doesn't actually give you any timing information. So if you need timing information out of your system, you need to set the memory mode to timing. So for any actual experiments you're running, you need to be in timing memory mode. So the next thing we're going to do is set up a memory range. So this is going to be our physical memory ranges. And we'll just do one address range, no E there, um, which is 512 megabytes. So we're just going to have one 512 megabyte range that's sitting um, as our physical memory. OK, so now we can start doing the other parts of the system that we need to create. So let's create a CPU. So for this, we'll use a simple timing CPU. 
or timing simple CPU, which is a simple CPU that has uh, everything execute. It's a single cycle CPU. Everything executes in a single cycle, except for memory operations, um, which take however long the memory system says to take. And then we're going to create that membus that I showed on the picture. That's going to be a system crossbar. And now we need to hook the CPU up to the memory bus. So to do this, it's in a system.cpu.icache port is system.membus.slave system cpu decache port system membus. So. so I'll talk more about this after the um, break as well. But these are the CPU and the Membus are memory objects. So they have these, this port interface between them. And so we're setting up the, uh, these two ports that the CPU have to connect up to the memory bus port. Um, so next, we need to do some x86 specific stuff. We need to create interrupt controllers, up controller, sorry. interrupts of zero. So set the PIO of this interrupt controller. Sorry about that. I'll give you a minute on that one. This is just setting up the x86 CPU so the interrupts will work. Um, and system.system port also needs to be connected up to the memory bus. Okay, and then the last part of the system that we need to create is the memory controller. Use a DDR3 memory controller. Set this memory controller's range to our system's range. And finally, hook this up to the memory bus. So now we've created this whole system. We've created the CPU, created a memory bus, created the memory controller, and connected them all up. So now we've created this whole system. So the next step will be to give it a binary to run. Are there any questions? Yeah. So the DDR3 is for 1600, like 64 is defined in the source code, or is defined in the Python? So, um, that's a slightly complicated question because, well, okay. This is a DRAM controller. Yeah. Then that DRAM controller is subclassed. Um, this DDR3600 X64 inherits from DRAM controller and sets some, uh, sets the parameters. So if I want to change the modify the memory controller, do I have to change the modifier of the DRAM controller? So you could change the parameter here. You could say, for instance, like RAS equals 10 nanoseconds if you wanted to change the row address stroke. Or I'm not sure if that's what it's called, but it's like, for instance. Um, so to answer your question, this is actually defined in source, but it doesn't need to be. It could easily be pulled out and put in the config files. That's a, that might have been something I wrote down to do this afternoon, actually. It's something I wouldn't take, but happen on it. Any other questions? 
All right, cool. So now that we've created our system, we need to hook up a binary to it. So we're going to run something. So to do that, we're going to create a process. Um, give the process a command. We're going to use one that is already compiled for us. Um, so this hello is just a hello world binary. <clears throat> you could run it natively and it would print hello world. So we set the CPU's workload to be this process. And then we have to call system create threads. So we're going to create our CPU threads. Um, and the last thing we have to do to set things up is we have to create a root object. And pass it our system. So uh, all Gem5 um, simulations have to have a root object. This is like the only thing that's required for you to do to simulate something in Gem5 is have a root. Um, everything else is you can do anything you want. So now that we've created our root, we call m5 instantiate. Instantiate. And what this does is take all these Python objects that we've instantiated and walk through all these Python objects and actually do the C++ constructors and construct all these objects in C++. This is at the time that you call m5 instantiate. Now all the C++ objects are constructed. Then, since this is Python, we can just print something out if we want to. So, for instance, we could say we're going to begin the simulation. And then call m5.simulate. And this kicks off this discrete event driven simulation. It starts popping things off the event queue and putting other things onto the event queue. So, whenever this returns, we're done simulating. So, we can print. Simulating. And then maybe we want to know what tick we're done simulation at. And we can also look at the reason. So we can investigate m5 got turk m5 dot cur tick, which tells us what the current simulation tick is after this exits. And if we do this, which I missed, this function returns an exit event, and we can see why it exited. Exit okay. So with all that, do you guys want to take bets on how many typos I have? No. I'll give you guys a minute to look at that. Any questions before we see if this works? No. I see people furiously typing away and looking at the screen stuff, so I'll wait. Seems to be slow. People, anyone else still need this up? You good? Okay. So now we can run this. So we're going to use our Gem5 binary. And the parameter we're going to pass to this binary is our config script. So we did configs, HPCA tutorial, simple.py. So this binary has a built-in Python interpreter. And so it's going to take this Python and file that you created and just execute that Python within the Gem5 um, binary. Yeah, must be mem ranges. 
Yep, it's supposed to be a memory. There we go. Only one typo. Wow. So, when we started running Gym 5, uh, here, you can see our, we wrote begin simulation in our Python script. So it printed that. It said info, we're entering the event queue at tick zero. And then we just executed the binary, which was hello world. Similarly, you could have executed the binary natively with te tests, test, test. Probs. Hello. So, that binary runs hello world, and Gem5 executed the binary to completion. Okay, so. Um, resume slideshow. So again, this was when we ran it, we, the binary we wanted to run, and then the config script. And for the most part, this config script is the only parameter you ever pass to your Gem5 binary. Um, so just a couple other things to mention. So I briefly mentioned about this port interface where we hooked things up. Ports connect memory objects. There's always a master and a slave port. Master send requests to slave, and slaves send responses back. Um, and then to register this master-slave connection, you can just use an equal sign in the Python. And behind the scenes, it does all sorts of stuff to set this up, but you simply need to use an equal sign. Um, and we'll talk more about this uh, later in the morning. So the other thing is, um, when we simulated this time, we used syscall emulation mode. So in syscall emulation mode, it emulates all these Linux syscalls. So every time it gets to a Linux syscall in the binary, it calls out into the Gem5 simulator to emulate that system call. There's no operating system or anything running in the background. And that's why we did this weird thing with setting up the process for the specific CPU. Um, so this process is an emulated process. In Gem5 is where it's emulating page tables, file descriptors, etc. Um, there's also full system mode, which might, one could argue, is more useful than syscall emulation mode, where Gem5 runs basically as a virtual machine. Um, and it simulates all the devices, you run a full kernel, um, et cetera. It's like full virtualization, like the Ingram or VirtualBox or something. All right, so um, any questions about that simple configuration script? Pretty simple, right? I don't know if you guys looked at the other example scripts like sc.py. That is not so simple compared to what we just did. No questions? Okay, so in the book, um, there's another chapter, uh, actually a couple other chapters about adding caches, which we're going to skip through um, pretty quickly. Um, <coughs> I just want to hit a couple highlights from this chapter rather than diving into it. So, um, let's see. So if you wanted to add a cache, you might say, what is the cache that I can add in my um, config script? There's some um, sim object somewhere that you're going to want to instantiate. So to find it, we can look in the source directory. So if we look at source mem cache, in this directory are a bunch of C files and um, header files, but there's also this cache.py file. So any of these py files in the source directory are um, sim object description files. That's what I think they should be called. Um, and what they do is they describe what the sim object is, what the interface to the sim object is, and the sim object parameters. And so for a cache, for instance, it has a size and an associativity. And importantly, <coughs> if you notice, get my pointer out, 
the size and associativity only has one parameter here, which is an, a description of what it is. Size, description is capacity, great description. Um, but if you look down here at like write buffers, it also has a default value. So in this case, it defaults to eight write buffers in this cache. Um, anything that does not have a default value, so size, associativity, latencies, et cetera, you have to set that in your Python configuration file before you call it in instantiate. Otherwise, when you call it in instantiate, you get an error saying the sim object wasn't fully created or something like that. So if we look at uh, a config file that uses these, So here is a caches config file. Um, so I import a cache, which will import that cache Python description of a sim object that we just saw. And then I created a new Python cla class, which inherits from it. And it sets some of these values, associativity, latency, et cetera. But it can also, you can create functions in here. Um, they're like connected to a bus, connected to the CPU. Um, you can inherit from the classes that you created. So this, the iCache inherits from the L1 cache and sets a default size. You can add options. This is all just Python. Anything you can do in Python, you can do in these scripts. So if you want command line options for your script, you can add them here. Um, and you do all sorts of complicated things. This is just briefly things that you can do here. Um, so, and then this was caches, and if we look at the actual run script, this imports that file that I was just showing you, and this sets up options. Um, and then here, this, act, this script will actually work with both x86 and ARM, or whatever ISA that you compiled for. Um, for the most part, it's the same. The only difference is here we add a couple caches and connect them to the CPU. And we add another bus. And then finally, just like before, we call M5 simulate them. So if we run this, so it runs similarly, maybe the slightly different time. But I added a few command line parameters to this. So now we could change, say, the L1 instruction cache size. So. L one i size equals let's set it to one kilobyte. So now it takes a little bit more time. I think that's uh, sixty one microseconds compared to sixty one microseconds compared to fifty eight microseconds. It took four more microseconds with only one kilobyte L one cache or i cache. I don't think the iCache affects the performance of this workload very much. Um, so yeah, that was just a brief thing of so some of the other stuff you can do in these config files. Um, the point that I really want to get across is um, using object-oriented design in these config files is good because it makes them much easier to read and then you can extend them um, and adding command line parameters, I think, you know, my opinion is it's a good idea to only add command line parameters to things you want to change. If you look at some of the other example config scripts, there's a command line parameter for literally everything, including command line parameters for things that don't exist. If you do se.py minus h, you'll see there's a parameter for the size of your L3 cache. You know what is never created in those config scripts? An L3 cache. So be careful if you're using those other config scripts. And again, this is just Python. Um, you can do anything you want that you can do with Python. And debugging these files, since it's just Python, is pretty easy. You can use print statements to debug. 
which I do all the time. Um, and then you can do this command line stuff, and in the text of the book, there's some more details about how to do um, Jimpop command, uh, command line parameters. I set up this simple ops, which is one way to do it simply, but you can use any of the Python built-ins for doing command line parameters. All right, questions about that? Went through that pretty briefly. Yeah? So in the first simple um, config, you use system x bar, and then this one you use the algorithm bar. So, so I think this one I actually had both. So this one was uh, actually a two-level cache hierarchy. Okay. And so I had an L2 bus between here and the L2 cache, and then a min bus behind that. Um, but those crossbars, um, again, they should probably de be defined in the um, configs and not in source. But they all inherit from this. So there's two different semi-optic crossbars, a coherent crossbar and a non-coherent crossbar. Not totally sure the differences, but I'm not a classic memory expert. Um, so there's two different sim objects, and th these are both inherit from coherent crossbar. But the only difference between the L2 crossbar and the system crossbar is the width, just the print, the width and latency of the crossbar. So it's just parameters. It's the same C++ object in the back end. So we can technically just use the crossbar and just use the If you used a system crossbar, it might not work because of uh, cache coherence okay. issues. So the system, crossbar um, system crossbar is the top level. It, it has an option, bottom level. I, I believe it has a parameter which says this is the root of the, the coherence. And so if you have more than one of them, the coherence gets messed up. But in a uniprocessor system, it shouldn't be an issue. It's complicated. Yeah. So you could easily you could easily have another L2 crossbar here and another cache behind that. Just create another cache object and another crossbar object. So the same place you have to change the just copy-paste? Yeah, basically. You could copy-paste and as long as your ports hook up in the right way, you would have to make sure to hook up the right ports here and here. Um, yeah. It should be that simple. It's a little bit more complicated when you get into multi-process. Um, because you do have to deal with coherence. But for a unit processor, it should be that simple. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, cool. Um, so the next step is understanding the output of Jumpbot. So if you look at, if you ls the folder in 5 out, you see three files, maybe more. Um, but the important ones are config.ini. So this dumps all the parameters of all the sim objects that you created. So any sim object you created in your Python will be, those parameters will be dumped out of this. This shows you exactly what you simulated. If you ever wonder what the default value was that you simulated, you can check config.ini to find the actual value that you ran. Um, the JSON version is the same thing, but a different format that's more difficult for humans to read. Um, and then there's stats.txt, which is the most important file, which gives you detailed statistical output. Every sim object can define some stats, and these get dumped out whenever you call dump stats or at the end of simulation. And they get dumped into this file. So let's quickly look at what stats.txt looks like. So we ran this uh, two level here with a reasonable size L1 cache. So if we look at stats.txt, over the top you have the sim seconds, and this is how much time it took in the simulated system. About 59 microseconds in this case. Gives you the number of ticks. Ticks are by default one picosecond per tick, or ticks run at the terahertz. You can change that default, although it's pretty rarely done. Um, some of this stuff is to host information to know how fast Gen5 was running. Um, and then this tells you how many instructions were run in some sense. But you can see some of, this is the memory controller statistics. It had 60, 364 read requests, but no write requests at the memory controller. 
um, you know, how many reads per bank. There are a lot of, can be lots of complicated stats here. You know, the CPU, see how many cycles the CPU was running, how many ops it committed, how many function calls the CPU saw, etc. So this stats to text file has all the stats um, that are currently defined in the same objects. And you can add more stats, um, which I definitely talk about in the book, but I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about today. Yeah. So the stats are not exposed to Python right now, which is, in my opinion, a major, a major feature Gen5 is lacking. Um, but what you can do is you can call M5 dump stats at any point in your Python config script. So you can simulate for like, um, you know, 10 microseconds, stop simulation, dump the stats, then read the stats.txt file, parse the stats.txt file, get the information you want, and then restart simulation after that. Um, so you can dump the stats and reset the stats um, anytime you want from the Python configuration file. But unfortunately, you can't just query some semantic stat from Python. Yeah? What was that? Yeah. yeah. When are the stats dumped? No. Or when is the config file? Oh, config.ini. Oh, yeah, that uh, config.ini is dumped, I believe, when you call m5 instantiate. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's exactly when it's written out, but that's definitely the information it uses to write out. Um, you could find out if you wanted by looking at uh, source python uh, m5 simulate.py. That would probably have that dump call. So the, that's probably where instantiate is called, and you could trace through to see where it's dumped. So if I have a parameter, um, it's a configuration parameter. So you can't change anything. After you call M5 instantiate, you can't change any parameters. You cannot. You can call functions on these sim objects if the function is exposed. Um, but you can't change any parameters. The parameters are set at M5 instantiate time. So, so the parameters are conceptually parameters passed through constructors in C++. Yeah, so yeah we'll see how they're passed through, and you'll see why that's yeah. not possible. But you can. Um, so yeah, the config that I know is cert almost certainly dumped out and instantiated. Um, you can modify these objects at runtime from the config file, but you do it by calling C++ functions on them, not by changing the parameters. Yeah, I mean, it's within the C++ function, you're changing parameters. Right. Yeah, but they won't be dumped out in the config file. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it went. So yeah. I should dump them. So if you change things, yeah, you can register a callback, an exit callback. And so this function will be called, whenever the simulation exits, this exit callback function will be called, and you could dump that information out there. Grep for exit callback. <laughs> Any other questions? On stats, I think it's where we were. Okay. Uh, 